Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Michael Collins, and I'm the Director General of the IIEA, the Institute of International and European Affairs here in Dublin. And I'm so very pleased to welcome you to this webinar, which is co-organized uh, by ourselves, the IIEA, and the European Commission representation here in Ireland. And of course, this event takes place on the weekend of Europe Day, which will be celebrated this Sunday, Sunday, May the 9th and it commemorates the anniversary of the Schumann Declaration of the 9th of May, 1950, when French Foreign Minister, as we know, Robert Schumann, set out his vision to create a European institution which became and has become the European Union as we know it today. This event is also part of an important month for us here at the IAEA. We're celebrating our 30th um, anniversary. So please, if you want further details of the many events that we're planning during and have planned during this month, please tap into our website and you'll find all the details there. But for today, we're absolutely delighted to be joined uh, by uh, the European Commissioner for Financial Services, Financial Stability and the Capital Markets Union, uh, Mairead McGuinness. And while it's Unfortunate that we're not able to welcome her here, indeed back uh, to the IIEA in person in her new capacity as Ireland's European uh, Commissioner. We are nonetheless delighted that she has offered to speak to us today via webinar. Commissioner McGuinness will speak to us for about 20 minutes and then we will go to your questions and, um, and the Commissioner's answers. Uh, and we take in as many of those as we can. And you'll be able to see and join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, a function which I think is now familiar to almost everybody, but you'll see it on your screen in any event. And please feel free uh, to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you. And as I said, we will come to them once the commissioner has finished her presentation. A reminder that the commissioner's presentation and the Q&A that will follow it are both on the record. So just to, if I may just say, um, to introduce the Commissioner more formally, uh, Maureen McGuinness is the European Commissioner for Financial Services, Financial Stability and the Capital Markets Union. And before joining the Commission in October 2020, uh, Maureen McGuinness was uh, first Vice President of the European Parliament uh, from 2017. And she served as an MEP for 16 years and was a Vice President of the Parliament uh, from 2014. And prior to becoming an MEP, she was, of course, an award-winning journalist, broadcaster and commentator. So, Commissioner Maureen, you're very, very welcome indeed. Welcome uh, to the IEA. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Michael. And can I say how uh, wonderful it is that we're adjusting to this new way of communicating, although I miss the, the, the crowd, if you like, in the room in the IIEA building. Uh, but it's good to be able to join and it's good to reflect on 30 years. And I want to, I suppose, congratulate uh, you on achieving uh, this milestone. Uh, and I wish you well with this wonderful programme of debate and discussion, uh, because the IIEA has always been involved in shaping and informing public policy and indeed informing the wider public um, and a salute to of course the chair Rory Quinn to you Michael and to all involved in the association and I want to pay a little tribute if I may to the late Brendan Halligan a founder member um, of the IIEA and to say Brendan if you're listening I'm so Oh, sorry, we never had that lunch because we talked about it so often, but I think his legacy is here for us all to, you know, pay homage to and, and to give respect to. So that's the past 30 years, what has happened. I think today what I want to look forward is to the next 30 years. And I think it's a good time to consider the future. Um, if you look at the past year or so has been very unprecedented, difficult for Ireland and the European Union. We're still coping with COVID. But the rollout of vaccinations, I think, is giving us all hope for the future. And indeed, yesterday, Commission President von der Leyen highlighted very clearly that Europe is to the fore in terms of the distribution of vaccines and also exports. So we are exporting 200 million doses uh, to the wider world, and we have distributed 200 million uh, vaccines to Europeans and all across member states, the rollout is forging ahead. Um, and it's interesting to say that others, of course, are not exporting. And I think it shows the openness of the European Union to the wider global challenge around vaccination. I think it's also true that we have, to some extent, reached an, an end of sorts, but maybe a beginning in the whole Brexit process. Um, so with all of what has happened um, in the last while, I think it's a good time to look to the future. And it's why we have a conference on the future of Europe, which is um, you know, for public consumption, for public debate. And we hope on Sunday that the conference will be officially launched in Strasbourg. And I really make a plea to people who are interested in, in how we will be in the future. 
uh, both in Ireland and being part of Europe on the key issues that are important to you. And I think COVID might actually change some of our priorities because of having to lock down, having to reconnect, uh, having to work from home. Um, all of those things have had an impact on society. And I think that will only unfold uh, as we look to the future. Um, one of the things that we've been very clear on in terms of the institutions is we want this conference to be driven by people. Uh, so there are no, if you like, preconceived outcomes. Um, I, today, of course, I'm going to restrict my comments to the future as I see it in the area that I'm responsible for, financial services and specifically banking. Um, the crisis, uh, you know, has challenged business uh, and the economy. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that banks, because of the regulatory framework put in place after the last crisis, are much more robust uh, and therefore have been able to maintain lending to the economy. But what do we need to look out for? Um, and I suppose COVID has accelerated some broader trends. We have widespread digitalization of finance. It's no longer a distant prospect, if you like. It's here now, and it does impact on the traditional banking sector. We've also been reminded in a very stark way that the natural world can have a huge impact on business and our economies, which means that we need to make our systems more resilient and more sustainable. And this is now more urgent than ever. And I think I'm going to have more questions today than answers, because a lot of what is happening is evolving and new dimensions are coming into play all of the time. So I want to, if you like, lay out the foundations and raise some of those questions about, you know, the ideas around the future of finance and the future of banking. Looking to uh, banking, let's start, of course, in Ireland. And in many ways, it is a special case, also affected by broader trends, transforming the general banking sector. But clearly the banking sector in Ireland has come along with since the global financial crisis. The legacy issues are still there, it's still relevant. And Irish banks face higher capital requirements on mortgage loans than banks in most other European countries because of the impact of the crisis. Another important reason for high capital requirements is that collateral enforcement is more difficult and slower than in other European countries. And as a result, Irish banks are holding more capital to issue loans. And, and these may be some of the factors behind the decisions of private banking groups about their operations in Ireland. Beyond those uh, specificities, Ireland is affected by the broader trends that are transforming the banking sector across Europe and indeed across the world. There is the pandemic where banks have so far remained robust. I think the full extent of the uh, pandemic uh, in terms of our uh, banking situation will only become visible over time. COVID has accelerated structural change, and this is unlikely to be reversed. So I don't think we're going to go back to the way we were. It includes digitalization, not only of finance, and also this journey that Europe is on and indeed is leading globally towards carbon neutrality uh, to tackle climate change. And we face you know, tough macroeconomic environment and demographic change. And all of this are transforming the situation in Ireland in Europe and further afield. And these issues are no longer distant. So we do need to think about their impact and how we can best respond. Look, the immediate priority here in the Commission and across the member states is the recovery from the COVID-19 crisis. And right now, member states are submitting their plans for spending under the Recovery and Resilience Facility, part of Next Generation EU. And you know, this is an unprecedented measure and it reflects the nature of the COVID crisis and the need for a big European response. We have a balance of investment uh, and reforms with over 670 billion euros in loans and grants being made available across uh, the member states. If we look at what has happened uh, to the European economy, um, economic output fell by 6.3% last year, and Ireland was the only member state to record positive growth of 3% uh, thanks to strong exports. Although, as you know, there were difficult domestic and different domestic impacts and a lot of variation between sectors, hospitality and tourism has been hit across the board. Likewise, public authorities also adopted extraordinary measures to protect households, companies and jobs. And the ECB put in place uh, monetary measures to maintain the lending capacity of banks and ensure favorable financing conditions. Here at EU level, we put in place flexibilities in terms of state aid and fiscal rules. And this allowed member states to take unprecedented fiscal measures to help businesses affected by the crisis, including loan guarantees, tax relief, direct subsidies, and loan moratoria. 
Um, of course, the full extent of the impact of the pandemic, as I say, has yet to emerge. And we have to acknowledge that the economic impact is very significant. We have a, a, a steep increase in private and public indebtedness. Uh, throughout this crisis. Um, and, and this is a consequence of the very necessary measures against the crisis. So we had to acknowledge that the first priority was public health. And in a sense, all else was pushed aside in order to save lives and to get people treated and to find a solution to the public health crisis. Therefore, the withdrawal of public support measures, in my view, needs to be very carefully managed and communicated in a very careful way. And of course, against all of that background, non-performing loans are a concern, in particular for banks that serve uh, countries and sectors most affected by the pandemic. And the level of insolvencies last year in Europe was very low, but of course we are expecting this to increase uh, in time. Now, to make sure that banks can support the recovery, they need to accurately and very transparently measure risks, along with ensuring that they have enough provisions to account for these risks. And it's true uh, that if you ignore problems, that doesn't help. It just creates uncertainty and undermines confidence down the line. And at the same time, maintaining the flow of credit to the economy um, has to be a key priority because banks have to continue to play a constructive role in the recovery. And we have to acknowledge that banks have been part of the solution during this uh, crisis uh, and, and good work has been done in that regard. But as the crisis support measures are phased out, many companies and viable business models may need their debt restructured. Lenders, corporate borrowers and national authorities have to prepare for this as, in as much as they can. So we redesigned fiscal support measures focused on debt restructuring and insolvency solutions, or rather solvency solutions. These are fundamentally uh, important for viable uh, borrowers and they're key to avoiding an excess of insolvencies. And the point I would make here, and I've made it to stakeholder round tables that I've chaired, it's really important that banks and borrowers talk early if they feel there is going to be a problem and work towards a, a solution because when there's no conversation, there can be no solution. And I do think we are in a scenario where an unusual crisis has arisen, which has now impacted on previously very viable businesses that have had to close. And I think we have to take account of the context and therefore engagement early is really, really important. But as the recovery um, hopefully gathers pace in the second half of this year, I think banks and public authorities will also have to finalize the long overdue post global financial crisis reforms. And that's one of the items on my agenda here, the, the, the Basel implementation. Alongside of this, and we all know that there has been a massive increase in bank deposits. So those that are still working are not spending because they can't, and at least not while the economy is in shutdown mode. And the question is, will this money flow out of banks when the economy reopens, or indeed will only some of it flow and what remains of the uh, large deposits that are sitting in banks and indeed not earning significant or at all any money. And I think this is an important question for our recovery. If we look at digital finance beyond COVID, um, I've mentioned the acceleration of technological change and we've all become accustomed to not having cash and not needing cash. Um, in finance, uh, there has been a number of benefits around these developments. So we have online identity verification that allows customers open banks and use financial services remotely. Uh, a growing proportion of in-store payments are now digital and indeed contactless. And fintech solutions have helped to broaden and speed up access to loans, including loans in response to the COVID-19 crisis. Now, of course, these impacts are not uniformly positive for everyone. With increased digitalization, we see uh, an accompanied measure where banks are closing branches. Um, and there was a decline already by over 6% on average in the number of bank branches in the European Union before COVID. Um, and we know that this will accelerate because of the pandemic. And of course, um, there are also social dimensions to bank closures, including for bank staff. If we look now then to the role of fintechs and big tech, um, change is happening in part because technology companies, large and small, are increasingly offering financial services. Now, this increases competition and may improve efficiency and financial inclusion. However, it also makes the value chains more complex, making it harder for supervisors to have an overview of risks. It can fundamentally change banking service supply chains. 
introducing new critical suppliers and a new category of risks that must be managed. It also has consequences for the business model of traditional banks. New fintech um, unbundle the full service model of traditional banks and big tech companies entering the financial services area use data and already extensive customer databases. I'm aware that fintech is a key part of the Irish government's Ireland for Finance strategy, where the country is aiming to become a world leader in fintech. And I suppose given that eight out of the top 10 global software companies have their European headquarters in Ireland, and over 250 of the world's leading financial services firms are based in Ireland, there is clearly big potential for fintech companies to thrive. For innovation to work in a fair and competitive manner, companies entering the payment sector, banking or other financial services, whether they are or wherever, whoever they are, or indeed wherever they come from, they need to be subject to the same level of regulation and supervision. And that's a challenge that European and national supervisors and regulators need to consider. And that's why in September last, the Commission set out very clearly the digital finance strategy for the European Union to help support the digital transformation of finance. And there are four strategic priorities. One, to tackle fragmentation in the digital single market for financial services. Digital finance is still too national. It's like our banking systems, too national. Addressing this would help European consumers access cross-border services and European financial firms to scale up their digital operations. Secondly, uh, the objective is to ensure that our EU regulation enables innovation. New technologies could improve financial services for uh, consumers and businesses. And regulation should make sure that innovation is accompanied by responsibility. Third, we want to create a European financial data space and we want to promote innovation driven by data. And this will enable new products for consumers and businesses, and it will support broader policy goals, such as building a single market for data. It will also help enable access to information we need to make sure that investment is sustainable. And we did a lot in that area in recent weeks. Fourthly, we want to address new risks and challenges. As digital finance grows, so do cyber risks. Looking beyond regulation, some of the questions that arise, like what are the consequences of digitalization and the growing role of technology companies for the banking sector? And by extension, for the supply to the economy of financial services traditionally provided by banks. Are consumers, are we willing to have different providers uh, to pay our bills, to borrow from, to invest with? And at the moment, it appears that consumers rarely switch financial service providers. I'm looking back to a 2016 uh, Eurobarometer survey. And in that survey, 71% um, of consumers hadn't changed any provider of financial products or services in the previous five years. Although my sense is that with a younger generation, they have a very different expectation of banking services and indeed are more familiar with the whole digitalization process and more comfortable with it. Other questions arise, uh, can these services underpin a profitable business model? when provided separately. So can banks be profitable enough if providing a mortgage does not create a loyal client or customer who will also buy the bank's investment funds? And again, what the impacts are on the availability and pricing of essential banking services, and what's the impact on competition? And does this herald broader changes in how credit is provided and our economies are financed? Now, at this juncture, I think it's really worth mentioning the possible issuance of a digital euro. A digital euro would be a central bank liability offered in digital form for use by citizens and businesses for retail payments. And as you know, the European Central Bank is exploring the possibility of a retail central bank digital currency, CBDC. And this would be as a complement to cash and private sector payments. And the aim here is to ensure that the euro remains fit for the digital age. And the ECB Governing Council will decide later uh, into the summer, whether they will move forward towards experimentation. But frankly, Europe is not alone in this. And indeed, we are not the first. 80% of global central banks are engaged in similar work. And China has been working on this for seven years. Now, I think it's really important to stress that a digital euro is not just a technical endeavor. It can have far reaching consequences in terms of monetary policy, cybersecurity, privacy, 
and money laundering. And a digital euro could also have fundamental consequences for banking services and credit intermediation. So would there be a shift away from bank accounts and towards digital wallets? And where would digital euros be held? What would the role of banks be? And as you can hear, I have more questions than answers. And I think there are some questions that we haven't quite thought of yet, but this is why we do need to have this conversation. And this is why we do need an ideas forum for the future of finance, in particular banking. On the bigger macroeconomic side, of course, there are other drivers of change. Europe is an aging continent, we're aware of this. Um, you know, uh, smaller populations or at least workforces. Um, but we are developing, and I think this is the interesting story from Europe, a new growth strategy built around sustainability, the European Green Deal. And despite the COVID crisis, there is no resiling from the direction of travel. The aim is that Europe will be climate neutral, but beyond that, that we will decouple if you like, emissions from growth, and that growth will be inclusive and fair. And I think because of COVID in particular, we have to deliver on those commitments that we have made. And um, when you look at the way interest rates are evolving, very low interest rates, this does impact uh, on banks' profitability. Uh, and we are not sure how that will evolve over time, or indeed what impact this would have on the bank business model over time. I think all of these developments, uh, together with growing competition from technology companies, I mean, is forcing banks to at least look at their cost structure. So we see a reduction, as I mentioned, in, in open bank branches uh, with the adoption of uh, digital developments um, and new retail trends for saving and investing money. And indeed, we have seen issues around staff uh, equally with banks addressing some of their internal concerns more questions here arise. So how will incumbent banks use a physical bank network to serve clients? Are all generations at ease with fully digital banks or is a physical interaction still essential for trust and meaningful financial advice? And financial advice is another area that we are working on here in DG FISMA for the future. So if you like um, growth, which is slower than we would like, low interest rates, this may also force further consolidation within the banking sector. But so far, consolidation is slower than expected and is taking place largely within national markets rather than across the single market. Um, and, and again, the question has to be asked as to why this is happening uh, and why is it not more pan-European? And part of the answer is the difficulty in operating a bank on a pan-European basis because of market fragmentation. Another is the difficulty we have in allowing certain banks to exit the market efficiently. And not for the first time you will have heard that completing banking union is a priority here in the Commission. And there are still very difficult issues to deal with, including an effective crisis management framework for all banks and a European deposit insurance scheme. I want to move briefly to sustainable finance. And again, I think the COVID pandemic has accelerated uh, the urgency of a shift towards sustainability. We've had a very clear and uncomfortable demonstration that our economies and societies, our healthcare systems were not at all resilient and we need to change that. So again, the European Green Deal involves a total transformation of our economy. We want to achieve, as I've said, this climate neutrality goal by 2050, but we have also committed to a very high target of a reduction in emissions by 2030 of 55%. So we're talking about an entire reorientation of the financial system and of our economy. And we're going to need an awful lot of money to do that. We will have, of course, uh, public funding, but private investment must be unlocked for us to achieve our sustainability targets. And one of the instruments to do that is the EU taxonomy, which identifies sustainable economic activities in a very clear way. We will also be asking companies to be very clear about how they report on sustainability. And that's why we have recently the um, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. We are essentially working to green the financial system, to green the, the economy. So these things work hand in hand. And I think also sustainability reporting is crucial to address any systemic financial risks arising from climate change. And I think future regulation in the banking sector cannot ignore this question of sustainability. Um, so we all really have to look at how we reflect uh, this issue of environmental criteria in banks lending decisions, and also how we protect banks from possible risks arising 
from climate change and how we finance the transition towards a low carbon economy. So there's a lot of challenges, but equally there's a lot of opportunities for those businesses that believe they have a future and know where they want to go and know how they need to invest that. So there are companies that are really ahead of the curve and are very interested in the work that we are doing here. You know, climate risk um, is more forward looking than traditional risks. So using historical trends won't necessarily be helpful to regulators or supervisors. I think equally difficult to assess is whether risks can become potentially systemic financial stability risks and work to better integrate environmental, social and governance risks into the EU bank prudential framework has already started. And already the Commission is assessing all possible options for a more sustainable and resilient banking sector. And again, we welcome new ideas for the future. So in closing, what will the banking sector look like in 30 years time? When I hope the IIEA will be celebrating its 60th anniversary. And I hope I live to see the day, but I might be stretching it. But, you know, this is a question about the future that I think we cannot answer today. But I think we should be aware of all of the different elements that will shape that future as we try and navigate these changes and try and make sense of what they will do to and with the financial system, in particular banking, whether it's profitability or resilience or digitalization or sustainability. You know, these all represent and present fundamental challenges and opportunities to the financial system and to our economies. Um, so I think these are really key issues. And again, to just say that um, the IIEA is an ideas forum, and that's why today I'm, I'm launching this idea of a much needed forward looking discussion on the future of finance and the future of banking. And I think the work you do is really an important part of this conversation, because we know that what we had 30 years ago is very different than what we have today. And in the next 30 years, it will be even more dramatically different. Thank you. Well, th thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, uh, indeed, for uh, that uh, very broad ranging address and your kind words indeed about the IAEA at the, the beginning of your speech and indeed at the end of your speech, and particularly your, uh, um, your, your, your um, references to Brendan Halligan, who was our, our founder back in, in uh, 1991. So lots of issues, lots of challenges affecting all of us, um, whether I suppose we're at the institutional level or as, uh, as consumers, citizens, investors or whatever. And maybe just uh, just to invite people to send in their questions on using the Q&A function, but just maybe to get the ball rolling, if I may, I may uh, Commissioner. Um, you know, it's getting very complex out there uh, uh, in the financial world. It is a complex world in any event, always was, even before the onset of, of, of current complexities. But just in the area of financial literacy, you know, how, how are people, how are consumers, how am I? Uh, you know, supposed to get my head around um, issues like the digital currency, the digital euro, all the issues in around, I mean, um, uh, the complications that you've mentioned there, the challenges that you've mentioned there, the simplicity that we once have just going into a bank and putting our money there, leaving our money now, faced with negative interest rates, all that type of thing, possibly. So how do we, or how do you, uh, at European level, how do we assure um, that we have a generation, a current generation, future generations coming forward with levels of um, uh, financial literacy that will equip them to manage this very, very uh, new space and indeed emerging space as well. Well, look, I didn't mention financial literacy, but it actually is the one area uh, of my prioritization in uh, this role, because I, I had the same questions. I was saying to myself, how can any one of us know the financial landscape or indeed ask the right questions when we are going for advice? So there are two issues. First of all, we have worked and are working with the OECD on a financial literacy framework, and we already launched that, I think, two weeks ago. That's hugely important because the OECD have done great work, but also whenever I can, but I'm doing it remotely, I'm talking to member states about, you know, stepping up on this issue of financial literacy, uh, because the truth of the matter is that those who have less information or knowledge about the financial system are, are usually those that are more vulnerable and therefore very often pay a higher price for credit than those who are knowledgeable. And I have always felt that morally and ethically that needs to be addressed. So I, my view is that none of us have sufficient knowledge of the system and therefore that all of us, whatever age we are, should 
try and tune into this whole concept of having more knowledge about the financial system. If you look at even traditional media, the financial parts are separate from the mainstream. And I think that is partly how people see the financial system. And maybe because I come to this role with some you know, training in, in, in long ago in terms of economics and, and accounting and finance, I also come with it with a consumer perspective. Um, and I have very much said here that we need to make sure that our uh, work here is outward facing to people. So in summary, Michael, what I would say is that I think all member states um, need to do more, but many are doing some things around financial literacy. And I would hope by the end of my mandate that I will have visited member states that I have got the best of all practices and that we will have in place a very sound basis for financial education, not just for the schools, but equally for the retirement associations or you know vulnerable groups that need uh, information about credit and I, I see a huge appetite out there for it and I, there are many agencies who want to work with us on it particularly now in digitalization because today if you pick up your phone you can have an app tell you where to invest and you can click and invest but you mightn't have asked the questions last point if you look at what happened in, in the US with GameStop, these were retail investors who were very knowledgeable. So there were individuals who clearly had knowledge of the financial system and were able to you know, beat against some of, of the bigger hedge funds. So in a way, we have to be very discerning as to who we want to protect because some are very, very tuned in, others less so. So I think this is an area, a big body of work that I'm hoping member states will you know, work with the commission on. And I think it would benefit all of us. We'll make better decisions if we have good knowledge or, or at least have the, the courage uh, to ask the right questions. Uh, and I've always been somebody, maybe it's my background, that I, I'm always prepared to ask the question where I'm not fully sure of what I'm being told. Uh, and then I can make the right choices. Okay, and just, I mean, and maybe just related to that, maybe uh, to some extent, uh, you mentioned the idea of this Ideas Forum, and of course the Institute has a, uh, is very much dedicated to the whole um, uh, idea of, of sharing ideas indeed. The Ideas Forum that you mentioned, do you, do you, do you see that as kind of in a structured way, as kind of a, stru a, a structure, or is it kind of a rolling kind of um, initiative of uh, involving speeches? Is, is there any kind of a, a, a particular structure to it that you'd like to, to, to talk about? Well, I suppose I'm launching it here because I wanted to, you know, to have a platform and your association is a perfect place to do that. And we will be looking at how we roll this out, not just in speeches, but in a very concrete way. We already have, um, I chaired um, uh, some months ago, uh, stakeholders uh, in the financial system, both consumers, um, users, large and small. Um, and we were focusing obviously on COVID, but I think equally we have to focus on these other questions. Uh, that are not answered about what what do we want but what do we think will happen and can we shape it in a way that is uh, offering opportunities where innovation is positive and we can manage the risks so today is really to launch the idea uh, which i think has already been mentioned in the irish context more about banking in ireland but i think it's a much bigger conversation i think it's about finance in the future which is why i chose this topic uh, to unveil so we will be looking at opportunities to engage with stakeholders uh, across the member states around this issue and we have our offices in member states and we have all of those contacts that will feed into it um, because the, the rate of change is quite uh, rapid um, and I'm sure that I'm not the only one asking those questions but I see it very upfront today um, and I always think that with change comes fear even with you know doing all we need around sustainability some people are fearful of it but equally there are opportunities um, and I think once you're aware of the implications, then you can plan accordingly. And I'm doing it also because my remit is financial stability. So I need to be not just looking at today's landscape, but I need to make sure that we're future proofed in terms of our financial stability, our regulation, our focus on entities, our management of risk. Um, so it's, it's to try and pull all of those things together uh, so that we will be forward looking and better prepared. But let me just take, come to a few questions, if I may, that are coming in from um, uh, from members of our um, uh, audience. I just one I see here, in fact, two related to the same thing. First from uh, Alan Jukes, and I come to the second one as well. It says uh, Alan says, um, um, who of course our former finance minister, he, he says the commission is attempting to make uh, the disbursement of the new 750 billion euro fund conditional on member states' adherence 
uh, to the country specific recommendations. He says there's no necessary link between these two. Do you think this is proving to be politically counterproductive? And there's a kind of a, a related question then from, or similar question then from Sarah Collins, um, uh, no relation of course, uh, from the Irish Independent. And she says, uh, or asks question uh, uh, on the, re the, the recovery and the resilience uh, plans. Ireland has yet to submit its plan to the EU and has been relatively quiet on it unlike France or Germany. Uh, she asked, do you, think, do you believe there is a reluctance on the Irish government's part to apply for money that comes with conditions, e.g. on tax reform? And how, and how hard will the Commission press Ireland to move on taxation? So, please over to you. You're, you're muted, uh, Commissioner. I do that to see that you're paying attention, Michael. <laughs> Uh, just, uh, on the particular um, of the uh, recovery and resilience, I mean, there's an awful lot of work going on here. And the, the, the priority is that member states not so much race to the, get their plan in, but, but come with a prepared plan and that there's a lot of discussion before the actual plan is submitted. So a huge amount of background work is going on. And when it comes to the particulars around um, country specific recommendations, I always think it's important to say that Ireland is not singled out so that every country is asked to look at its country specific recommendations and make progress on some or all of them. And in Ireland's case, there are four. Uh, and one of them is related to broadening the tax base. But to to I think Sarah's question about whether the you know the commission is forcing or whether Ireland is reluctant, I don't see either as being the case. Um, uh, my involvement in this is with the cluster under my uh, colleague, uh, Executive Vice President Broskis, where we look at these plans and where we know that. Uh, there has to be fairness so that nobody is treated differently. So some member states have got their plans in, others are well prepared. Uh, I think others might come later. And the commission has said repeatedly that they don't want plans in at speed, they want plans in that will work. But we want to get the money out. We want to get the money flowing so that investment flows. So I, I don't see it in the way you frame it in the sense that this is the commission either forcing Ireland to do something it doesn't want to because Ireland is well able to articulate its concerns. But clearly there are four recommendations that are for Ireland and there are many others for other countries as well. And the Commission will on balance look at what member states are submitting that they will do. And others, I think it's important to focus not just on tax, you know, providing support to companies, SMEs, um, through measured, uh, through, I'll just read these here because I think they're important, you know, ensuring liquidity, supporting employment through developing skills. I mean, that's another of them. And obviously as well to take all measures to effectively address the pandemic. There's quite, I mean, before we always focus on the one where a little bit, maybe as a member state, we feel feel uh, conscious of, but there is no sense in which uh, the Commission is treating Ireland differently than it would treat Portugal or than it would treat Italy or Germany. All countries are required to make progress on their country specific recommendations. And I think that when this uh, takes off, and I think there will be a sense of a rejuvenation when this money starts flowing, we want to make sure that it isn't just about big projects, which it is partly through investment, but also that there are some um, reforms that are long term and have a lasting impact as well uh, on that side of the equation. So I hope that answers uh, the question. Okay. We've, we've two questions here related to um, the exodus of um, banks from the Irish market. So I'll take the, I'll give you the two of them. Um, one, the first one is what is the commissioner doing uh, to reverse the exodus of banks from the Irish market, increase competition in the sector and ease capital requirements on lenders? And will the commissioner allow so-called vulture funds to continue to operate in the EU and purchase uh, NPLs uh, from uh, fully serviced banks. That's the first question from Donald Sheehan of the Irish Farmers Association um, Farm Business Policy Executive. And there's a, a second question in related, um, similar from Mark Paul uh, from the Irish Times. And he asks, can I ask the commissioner to expand on what she said about the foreign, about foreign uh, banks leaving the Irish market and how much of this is down to the fact that enforcing security here is slower and harder uh, than elsewhere. Well, thank you for, for the questions. Um, I did mention to that second point uh, that some of the reasons uh, in my speech about why 
uh, and I say these may because we don't know the extent of the contribution they make, but higher capital requirements and more difficulties around uh, repossessions may be some of the reasons why. I mean, it is up to those banks, the private operators, to explain exactly why they're leaving the Irish market. Um, but as somebody who comes from a, a family that used to bank with Ulster Bank, I think um, if my father were still alive, he would be shocked to even think that this is happening. And I suppose that's why we have to be mindful that in the future, there will be things happen that might cause me a shock when I reach a certain age. So the question asks, what am I doing to reverse? It's not my role as commissioner for financial stability to reverse decisions by private operators. Uh, when it comes to other issues, uh, whether it's competition, there are colleagues here, uh, my, my, my good colleague, um, uh, Margarita Vestiger, if that is an issue, this is where it will be looked at. Um, so it isn't, as I say, my role to reverse. The second point then around, um, will I allow vulture funds and NPLs? Look, in December last, we launched an NPL strategy and we did it in December rather than leaving it till now so that there would be a focus early on a likely increase in non-performing loans. And the reason we do that is to alert both borrower and lender that if there are problems, please talk to each other early. I've repeated that point now, but equally in order to make sure that banks can continue lending, one of the things we can't allow happen is a buildup of non-performing loans on balance sheets. That's just not going to help anyone. And it will, if you like, lead to a credit crunch, uh, which will impact everyone. And therefore, what we need to see is a market, a secondary market for non-performing loans that works well within the European Union. Um, so I'm not here to call up for any particular um, entity that might be in that market. But I will tell you that the European Parliament um, you know, have been debating this and working on a directive on credit services and credit providers. So it's gone through through the legislative process uh, with the caution that I had when I mentioned the NPL strategy in December, that maybe because of coming from the member state I do, I, I understand very well. And because I was an elected member of the European Parliament for a long number of years, I've dealt with people who had difficulties uh, with some of those who had bought uh, mortgage packages or loans. And the biggest difficulty was getting in touch with the entity that had done that. So my work here is to make sure that we have uh, financial stability, that our banks can lend, but also to watch the implications and consequences where we have uh, the selling off of, um, of non-performing loans. But it is a part of the market that allows the other side to continue lending. But you should never allow that to dilute any of the rights uh, that borrowers have and how they will be treated. And again, I think because of our experience in Ireland in particular, we're mindful of these issues uh, because of uh, the experiences uh, that I've referenced. Um, so uh, I, we will be mindful of that, but our role is to make sure that the market works, the secondary market works, works effectively, that there are European solutions. Uh, and I would like to see more of that um, so that we avoid any of those difficulties of the past. But frankly, I would like to think that we would manage to, if you like, to stabilize the situation for many SMEs um, who had very good businesses prior to COVID and suddenly shut and now have problems. Because with a little help, with a little bit of um, a bridge, as I would call it, they can survive and thrive and grow. And I think we need to prioritize that. And I'm sure in member states, this will be a priority. I talk to colleagues who have a big tourism sector as indeed Ireland has. And in these areas, we have to be conscious uh, of trying to keep those entities that can get over this difficult path alive. And how we do that, I think can be managed between borrower and lender and equally with the member state uh, supporting in the best way possible. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I have two questions here that feature the word Brexit, not surprisingly. So uh, not quite the same questions, but I'll give you the, both of them anyway, and you, you maybe just address them as you as you can. So uh, first question is from Mary Brown of University College uh, WCD. She says, thank you, Commissioner. She says, uh, financial services have, have experienced a hard Brexit. Uh, what are your hopes for the recently agreed UK and EU memorandum uh, of understanding on uh, financial uh, services. That's from Mary Brown. And the second one related to uh, the, um, uh, financial services from Gavin Barrett um, um, in UCD. He wants to know how is the future uh, of financial services provision in Ireland different in the wake of Brexit? 
Okay, um, I'm sure Brexit was going to come up, so I left it for the questions, but really important questions. Firstly, in relation to the memorandum of understanding, um, in a way, that's a very technical uh, memorandum, how we will, if you like, UK and European Union uh, behave with one another, the mechanisms around how we will engage and timing. So it's quite a technical issue. And that's going through uh, the procedure internally, both uh, in Commission and in Council. Uh, the second layer of that will be when the memorandum is in place. We are obliged to meet twice a year, but clearly the first meeting will have to set out what are the issues and, and uh, you know, the background to our conversations. It's true to say, um, and I think it is commendable that the Commission made decisions last year around equivalence so that on January the 1st, while there was a, a seismic change in the financial architecture, there was no disruption um, of uh, the financial system. And that is still the case today. The United Kingdom granted equivalence to, I think it was over 20 areas, but they granted it to the EEA as opposed to the European Union, which uh, is interesting. Um, and equally, we in turn granted some equivalents that we felt were important to us. And the big question for us uh, as, the, as a union, and when we talk about open strategic autonomy, which is an issue on our agenda, is are we comfortable with having a significant part of our financial infrastructure based in London, which was the heart of the European financial system to some extent, or do we need to look in the medium and long term as to what the risks might uh, you know, attach to that dependency? So around CCPs and these clearinghouses, there is a, that is a sensitive issue. So it, when you ask um, you know, what differences have emerged, nothing yet because the ground was, was perfectly laid. I mean, what we're watching and listening to are comments and speeches <clears throat> from the UK about what their vision is for the future of the financial system. And given that Brexit is based on divergence or being different, we have to try and analyze carefully what that difference will mean. Uh, and therefore we have to be cautious. We're not going to come to the table with um, a collection of uh, measures that we're granting equivalence uh, to the United Kingdom for. Uh, we will go to the table when it is appropriate and see what is in our interests around equivalence. And that's still um, in play. We're, we're working with a working group, looking in particular at some of the more sensitive financial infrastructure and asking the question, how and when, and, and is it wise to see, could we relocate within the European Union? We saw the chairs trading in the UK moved to Amsterdam. So there's been a natural evolution um, of some of the financial system. And I think Gavin, you asked, how is the future different uh, because of Brexit? Well, I think the future will and is different now because we had a very large financial centre in London when we were EU 28. We will have, uh, I think, a few financial centres of which London is one, Frankfurt, Paris, um, and there will, in my view, be probably specialisation in different centres um, rather than one place where everything comes together. But again, the future will be impacted hugely by all of these technological developments around digital currencies and all of those things that um, we, we are still trying to evaluate the impacts of on the entire financial system. But I, I'm pleased that the area that I'm involved in isn't the one that's in the headlines at the moment. As you know, around other issues related to Brexit, there's quite a lot of, of work going on to try and make sure that agreements are implemented. Uh, and I mean, my final word on Brexit is that there won't be a final word on Brexit because it is forever. Um, I was just reflecting with my colleague Maros Shefkovic, our vice president, that um, in a way we are right, having to recreate structures outside of the EU 27 in order to accommodate our relationship, which we want with the United Kingdom, and to make sure that all of the um, decisions made in the TCA and the withdrawal agreement are implemented. So there's almost a double layer of work. Um, and apart from some of the headlines, I think most of us, all of us appreciate that, you know, headlines sometimes are not the real story and that the real story for me is that I am responsible for financial stability and I have to be mindful from a European perspective in conjunction with our member states to do everything in our power to ensure financial stability. And also if there are opportunities for the European financial system, I think the system itself will seize those opportunities, particularly in, in a digital era when having a number of centers is, is not as big a deal as maybe in the past. But I would say, of course, the UK are all, also very conscious uh, and are trying to 
probably hold on to what they have. Um, but I've said uh, it, we are not going to recreate the, um, if you like, the benefits of the single market when the United Kingdom has very much decided to be out of the single market. Um, uh, thank you, Commissioner. Just um, maybe two questions I'll, I'll link here, even if they're, they may not be directly linked, but just in the interest of time efficiency. One is from a former colleague of mine, indeed, Bobby, Bobby McDonough, former Irish ambassador to the UK and indeed Perm Rep in Brussels. He says, Ari asked, how uh, should the Conference on the Future of Europe strike a balance between ambition and pragmatism? And do you expect any issues relevant to your own portfolio uh, to arise um, at this uh, conference? And uh, there's a second one here from uh, Paul Sweeney, um, um, former ETUC uh, Economics Committee Irish Rep. He says, would you agree that one of the best ways to combat Euroscepticism is to demonstrate that the EU is not simply a single market for business and thus social Europe must now get um, a greater priority and urgency from the Commission? Maybe not directly related, but you may be able to write them. You're, you're muted again, Commissioner. You are paying attention. In relation to Bobby's question about the conference on the future of Europe, I mean, look, there are people who have huge ideas for Europe and there are those who have less uh, ambition or whatever way you would describe it. Um, but I think the most important thing is that people have a chance to contribute to the debate. Um, I suppose given what Ireland has gone through because of Brexit and we've been, if you uh, like, uh, in a way that's unwelcome being at the centre of all of this because we were the most impacted and we had to um, you know, with the help of the European Union, get over the impacts and consequences of Brexit. Maybe it's time for Ireland to, you know, look to what our future in Europe is, to what we want Europe to be. And, and that's why it's really important that Irish citizens get involved in this. It's always a balance. And I think, Bobby, you will know that, that we never in Europe go um, one leap forward. We take steps forward. Look at what happened around COVID, the initial crisis around protective equipment, the difficulties with the vaccine rollout, but, but, but always in the end getting there and always being better for having gone through a difficult moment and stronger for the future. So as to what might emerge from it, some people want treaty change, others don't like the words change or indeed treaty. So you, you, you're gonna have to balance this somewhere along the line, but it's probably a good time to have the conversation given that we've gone through so much. And yes, in, in relation to the area where I'm involved, I, I think this should be part of the discussion because I think it's fundamental that we talk about our financial system, our financial health, even financial literacy, dare I say it, that we've just discussed. Um, in, in relation to Paul's question about social Europe, that it's not just about I mean, I suppose in a way we, we kind of make this divide, even though the, these two issues have to be joined because social Europe needs this, you know, the buoyancy of, of, of the system uh, to provide social services. I think sustainability questions will change both thinking and orientation. It hasn't happened fully yet. I think the debate in Ireland is taking off. It's very tense. Uh, one of the things that I think is regrettable around climate change, for example, and environmental issues is that you have almost two camps, one in favour and then another side and there's a clash. I think we could do with more informed discussion around why it's important that we tackle climate change, why we tackle biodiversity and how we do it. And, and it is true, Paul, that in, in relation to social concerns, one of the commitments we have made is that in this transition, we will need, leave no one behind. And that is a very big commitment that needs to be delivered on around just trans transition fund uh, and around making sure that when we are rushing towards a more sustainable future, that everybody feels they're part of that uh, and not being stampeded over in that particular rush. But I think few of us have taken on board the profound changes that are coming both to society and economies and companies and the financial system around sustainability. And I put it like this, um, that, you know, it took a long time for us to agree on accounting standards so that we could measure performance and compare company with another. We're going to spend a little bit of time, we don't have as much time to delay on setting sustainability standards. So how companies, uh, in two ways, how climate change and environmental issues impact the company, and then how the company is impacting to the outside world, also around human rights. Uh, and we may well end up at some time with the taxonomy around social issues. We certainly are doing more on the environment side. So there's an enormous amount of change, which does change the focus, not away from economic issues or just to social issues, but maybe to blend them better. 
Uh, and I think we would have a better economy and society where we could blend those better. And again, COVID-19 has, has shown for all our sophistication, there were sections of our society, I'm thinking of women, I'm thinking of carers, um, who really have not had uh, a very good moment, who have been under pressure. And I think we've all had to think about these things and that should impact uh, on some of the policies, not just at EU level, but also uh, at member state level. Um, thank you, Commissioner. I just, I'm just conscious of time now, uh, and just want to get in at least one more question here, uh, uh, possibly. So, question here from Mark Coleman, who's um, a long-standing indeed IAEA member. He says Ireland's EU membership, growing international financial services sector, and common law system and proximity to the UK uh, puts us uh, in an excellent position to act as a global bridge for the green finance agenda. Could you give us an overview of EU Commission work in this area and while you don't represent Ireland, but rather the EU, what are your thoughts on our potential in this area? I think, thank you, Mark. I think I mentioned, um, you know, Ireland's um, financial base of having a strong number of companies. So we have a, a very strong uh, financial ecosystem. And I think the government is already planning that Ireland will play a role around sustainable finance. Uh, so yes, there is a role there for, for Ireland and other member states. So there's opportunities around providing finance towards our more sustainable economy once we have the information. And I think at the moment there are huge information gaps so investors aren't really sure about what they're hearing about their investment portfolio, that it is actually matching uh, their sustainability needs. Uh, we're advancing rapidly um, work here around sustainability reporting, around financial uh, entities declaring how much of their portfolio is actually around sustainability issues. So yes, I think Ireland could play a huge role in this. I think we have a lot to do internally in Ireland and we can also do a lot uh, in the wider European context around sustainable finance. And at the moment I mentioned how we have a buildup of deposits in, in banks, even though interest rates are, you know, there's no return or there's negative if, you, if, you, if you're that lucky to have that much. But it does beg the question as to why we um, have not yet developed capital markets where retail investors are comfortable about investing, not leaving money on account, but investing. So these are this is another area that I didn't mention, but it is an area, you know, getting our attention so that we use capital to the best uh, and shape and reshape our society towards uh, greater sustainability. And I think that's an ask that the next generation are already putting to us. Um, and I think COVID has really advanced that type of thinking. I don't think we're going to go back to the way we were because I'm not so sure that was a great place, but I think we should learn maybe from some of the experiences of having gone through a crisis, how vulnerable we are. Uh, we thought we were maybe sophisticated and developed, but actually an invisible virus is holding us hostage. Um, and we weren't, if you like, prepared sufficiently in terms of our public health systems. On the other hand, look at the speed at which our research, our innovation, our bright minds were able to come and find a solution and a vaccine. Uh, and I think that should give us hope. So yes, Mark, is the answer to that question. So Commissioner, I'm just going to try and get in two more questions, one from a member of the audience and then just one final question, if I can, in the three or four minutes that are remaining. But so a question here um, from um, David McCauley, who's from the Donor um, the Credit Union. He says, dear uh, Mairead, uh, the Irish credit union sector has proved to be remarkably resilient uh, during COVID and members have shown their trust with uh, growing savings. As credit unions are community focused, how can Europe support the unique status of credit unions and how can Europe further enhance and allow credit unions to grow uh, their social impact? So that's, that's the first thing. We'll come back then for one final question if we may. Okay, well, well thank you for, for the question. I mean, as somebody who got her first loan for a car from RD Credit Union, I mean, I have a lot to, you know, be thankful for for credit unions. I think credit unions in their um, early stages were very much, they were essential for communities and for access to credit. Um, and, and as much as you're asking me that question, David, I think that you probably have the answers because you will know uh, what regulation impacts you either positively or negatively. Um, but it would seem to me that in the landscape where there are some um, banks withdrawing from the Irish market, that the, I would put it to the credit union movement to see what it can do to help fill if you like some of the gap that will exist there, what services you can offer, um, what facilities and what rates you charge. So I think it is about you seizing the opportunity. As I sit now, I don't think there's anything in particular we can do. I've talked to, for example, the German savings bank. So there's different models in different member states. What I 
think might be helpful, and I know you coordinate at, at European level, is if you have particular issues that might be helpful for me to understand from your perspective, then I'm very happy to hear that. But as I said, I have a long standing relationships with credit unions for, for all the good reasons. And lastly, to say that it does trouble me in this role, uh, which is about the big financial system, and you raised the issue of um, you know, financial literacy, but there are still too many people in society who don't have access uh, to money. And if they do, they are charged exorbitant rates. Frankly, I think around social issues, that is a big social issue that needs to be tackled. And, and I hope I'll be part of doing that. Okay, thank you. Um, I hope the car is still uh, functioning, but perhaps not at this stage. But uh, finally, just if I could, it just brings back to COVID. And um, just at your introductory, uh, the introductory remarks you mentioned about the uh, European Union and, and its, um, it, what it, the role it's playing as an exporter of vaccines to the wider world. And of course, topical at the moment uh, is the question of the waiver on intellectual, intellectual property. Uh, and obviously the Americans have got out there in front now and uh, you know, uh, look particularly uh, noble in, 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 in the uh, initiative that they've taken. Just where is Europe in all of this? I think I heard Angela Merkel or saw Angela Merkel last night, um, Chancellor Merkel, and obviously Europe obviously has a somewhat different perspective. And I think I, think I heard also Mr. Foreign Affairs, uh, Simon Coveney, you know, maybe uh, closer to the American line. What is it, or how can Europe um, uh, advance further in this area? And is there a capacity for it to align with what the Americans are now doing? I think the first thing, and I mentioned the, uh, the, uh, the figures about what we're exporting. And if you look at who else is exporting, we're probably, we are streets ahead. So Europe is doing its part. I mean, the question is, and Ursula, the president addressed this yesterday, where she said, we're open to looking at the US idea because we need ideas. But what we need are um, an increase in production of vaccines so that we can supply the world. And it isn't quite as easy a process as putting on, as you know, a switch or off a switch. It's a very complicated process to get production facilities in place. But Europe is open to listening. Um, and also the timeline involved. Um, will it be uh, a long drawn out process or can it be done urgently? Uh, but there is no doubt um, the realization that, uh, you know, COVID-19 is going to be around for a while. We are indeed preparing that Europe will need a booster dose next year. So I know, Michael, you said you've been, uh, you, you've got your shot. It will, I think we're all going to get shots again next year so that we will have to have rolling production capacities. So anything I think that can help in that direction is worth pursuing. And I think under the WTO TRIPS um, agreement, there are, you know, within that um, ways of maybe allowing licensing to work. Uh, but equally, we need to make sure that there is research and innovation continuing for the next iteration or for a pandemic of other um, dimensions. I did read, I think, this morning where um, the Thonishta Leo Varadkar uh, made a comment that in one sense, in sense was like having, you know, giving the recipe to somebody, but not having the kitchen or the skills uh, to actually produce the product. So that speaks to the reality that as we've discovered in Europe, you need a lot of materials um, and you need to draw it from many places to produce a vaccine. The world needs more of all of the above. And I think any ideas are worth exploring. And the good thing that I have discovered since we have a new American administration, whether it's on climate change, or security issues, there's an openness to dialogue so we can talk and we can get things done. And therefore, I think the world is in a better place to help those who, unfortunately, whether it's India or Brazil or other places, you know, the death toll is, is horrific. Um, we see the pictures and then we can turn away, but they're living with it. So it's why we invested in COVAX. Uh, and, you know, even in the worst of days, uh, President Ursula von der Leyen was saying we have a duty not just to look after ourselves when others were only looking after themselves. So I think when you look back at Europe's record, I think it will stand well. Well, that's a, a good note to end on, uh, Commissioner. I want to say thank you to you for um, uh, coming and speaking to us, uh, even if it is virtually. Um, we'll see you in Dublin again, hopefully before too long. Uh, but as I said, uh, we've covered an enormous amount of ground. I, I think we could have been going uh, for a little while longer. But we've already trespassed slightly on your time. I think we've taken in a, a good number of questions, haven't been able to get to them all. Uh, but on a future occasion, I'm sure you'll come back and join us. And in the meantime, uh, we wish you the very best uh, of luck. And, um, and, uh, you know, in what is a very complex area, but I suppose it's an area which affects each and every one of us. So um, uh, good luck at all that endeavour. Well, thank you very much and happy 30th. Enjoy Bye. your afternoon. Take care. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.